tell me when to go. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. It's a beautiful day. Nice sunny weather. Hopefully it'll stay around for a little bit longer. It's my pleasure to introduce Scott Harp. Scott Harp is no stranger to those who love restoration history. Uh, I first come acquainted with Scott through his website, therestorationmovement.com. And if you are not familiar with therestorationmovement.com, you ought to be. And uh, he's got a treasure of information there that's been very beneficial to me. Uh, and I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that. Uh, also, if you're interested in restoration history, uh, you may also find on Facebook, the Friends of the Restoration, uh, a very good and enjoyable, profitable learning experience as well. And I've, I've learned a lot from Scott. Scott probably doesn't realize how much. And uh, he's been a big blessing to me. Uh, he wrote a biography of Gus Nichols and published it himself, if I recall him talking about it. He said that way he could put everything in there he wanted to do and not have an editor take it out. And anybody who's had to do that knows what that's like. Uh, he wanted me to mention a book that uh, we brought in uh, to support these lectures because you just can't cover everything. Uh, Theology of Three Early Restoration Documents by L.L. L. Briggins. And we have them here for sale. You can buy them uh, $6 a piece or two for $10. So you just see me and you can get a copy of that. But it's L.L. L. Briggins' analysis of the Declaration Address, the Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery, and Alexander Campbell's Sermon on the Law. So you'll want to have that if you have not seen that. Um, before I turn over to Scott, let's bow. We'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful we have this opportunity to be here in Knoxville at the Carnes Congregation and be a part of the lectureship that's put on by SEIBS. And pray that you'll bless the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies and all their efforts to train gospel preachers. We're thankful for those who have gone before us who have laid a foundation for us that we can learn from them, that we can enjoy the stories of their lives and also learn the principles that they help us to see that are in the Bible. And pray that you will be with Scott as he delivers thoughts about Thomas Campbell and his influence he's had on us through the Declaration Address. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David Kenny, for introducing and uh, introducing me this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here today. Uh, I guess the first thing I should say is I'm not Gary Hampton. Uh, Gary was supposed to be here, and he called me on Thursday and said that with uh, due to Teresa's uh, health concerns, uh, needing to go to the doctors and planning some surgery uh, for her, or trying to find out, explore that said that uh, they, he just was not going to be able to make it over here and he asked me to step in and I was honored to be able to do so. So I guess first of all I want to just say to, uh, to Gary and Teresa we're praying for you and uh, we're wishing the very very best in health for Teresa uh, during this uh, particular time. But uh, So his assigned topic this morning was to talk about the thinking of Thomas Campbell as seen in the Declaration and Address. And as David mentioned here before about the book, uh, Theology of Three Early Restoration Documents, three of, I guess, some of the most important um, documents of early history in the United States uh, of thought about trying to encourage people to go back to the Bible and to allow the Bible to be the ultimate authority, to be complete authority in all biblical matters, worship, daily Christian life, how to become a Christian, and so on and so forth. And so the uh, Declaration and Address and the Last Will and Testament of the Springfield uh, Presbytery in 1804 and the 1816 uh, Sermon on the Law by Alexander Campbell, all three just cornerstone documents that will help fashion the thinking of any person who really is striving to, um, to just be Christians, like you read about in the New Testament. So I want to encourage you to get the book. Six bucks, you, you can't go wrong. David's got these, or two for $10, do get those. And I think they'll be helpful. 
he mentioned, now he, tomorrow he's going to talk about how Alexander Campbell was influenced by the Declaration and Address, and whereas my focus is more on his father and the thinking that went into the production of the, the document itself. And so just not knowing where you are and how much you understand about uh, the Declaration and Address and about some of the things that were going on, uh, going on around the turn of the, of the uh, 19th century. I think it's good for us to back up a little bit and uh, just tell you a little bit. So what I'm going to do in my lecture this morning in the next little while is to talk to you about two things. First of all, I want to tell you what the document is, kind of a little bit about what's in it. Uh, but then I want us to really focus more on what led Thomas to be thinking about uh, the things that brought him to the writing uh, of, the, of the document itself. Of course, the picture you see is of Thomas Campbell uh, when uh, somewhere around the time he would have written this document in 18, the summer of 1809. And so um, uh, we're going to press on here. There we go. All right. So a little bit about what the document or what the declaration and address is and what it says. Well, it is a big document and it's got a lot of information in it. Uh, it, 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 was, um, it. It was a document that was written uh, in the location of Washington, PA, Washington, Pennsylvania, in the kind of the, the southwest corner of the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, there was a group of, um, of people who were trying to be followers of Christ. They mainly had connections with Presbyterian roots. Uh, there. They considered themselves Presbyterians, but they had started an association called, called the Christian Association of Washington. And so this document was read on September the 7th, uh, 1809. And um, of course it's called Declaration and Address. So it has two parts. Uh, you got the Declaration, involves nine resolutions, um, which were um, 1,294 words, um, and basically said, this is what we're doing. It's kind of explaining to the world, here's what we're doing in our Christian association. Uh, then there was the address. It's 13 propositions, 26,288 words, and uh, it's an appeal to the association, to the group of people, to actually do what the declaration uh, sets out. But the bottom line is simply this. It's a written apologetic for just taking the Bible alone for their authority in all religious matters. And so that, that's in an, about as much a nutshell as I can give you on 27,000 words. Um, I, was, I did a little uh, search online and uh, found that uh, it would take about three hours and 45 minutes at about 130 words a minute <laughs> to say this speech. And so apparently he read it. I've read some sources that said he read it over time, but I, I, I think from what I can see, he probably read it. They were used to hearing long sermons back then. Uh, and so that would have uh, probably taken place all that day. So a little bit about the declaration itself. I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the nine propositions uh, or the nine declarations. First of all, just verbatim. It's, the first one is, we're going to form ourselves into a religious association under the denomination of the Christian Association of Washington for the sole purpose of promoting simple evangelical Christianity. And you want to remember that, simple evangelical Christianity. In other words, they were trying to be, uh, they were trying to tell people about the gospel. Uh, they wanted the world to know about the gospel. Now we'll talk about the problems with that as it falls into the realm of the Presbyterian concept of religion in just a few moments. But evangelical Christianity, free from all mixture of human opinions and inventions of men. So in other words, all the other 
extraneous documents, uh, any kind of uh, body of doctrines like the Westminster Confession of Faith or any other kind of confession. Uh, it's basically here. We just want to go back to the Bible and promote Christianity, you know, kind of like Acts 2 and, and on, like you read about in, in the Bible. Number two, we're going to fund it. <laughs> Uh, half yearly specified sums uh, that were people in the association were going to pay. Number three, we're going to be evangelistic about it. We're going to tell people about it, trying to get other groups formed like it. Number four, we're not a church. See, that's important to see. We're not starting a church. Now, a lot of things you read about Thomas and Alexander Campbell is that they started the Church of Christ or that they started the Disciples of Christ in America. They never consider themselves as starting a new church. And, and so right there in, at the first, he's saying, we're not a church, but we're a group of voluntary advocates to church reform. They were Presbyterians, and they were trying to help the church that they were part of. Number five, and, and here again, this is verbatim. He says that this society formed for the sole purpose of promoting simple evangelical Christianity and conforming to the original standard in converse, conversation, that is, activity and doctrine. In other words, what we do, what we teach. In other words, we will do nothing from opinion, only by a thus saith the Lord. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's kind of what we preach, right? We're just trying to, again, do Bible things in Bible ways. And he coined that phrase as well as other phrases. Um, but that's, that's part of the declaration. Number six, a standing committee of 21 people appointed to transact the business of the society. Number seven, the society will meet twice a year to conduct the business, collect the money. Number eight, how the society meetings will be conducted. Um, uh, starts with a sermon. Everything started with a sermon uh, with Thomas Campbell. And then other business was taken care of as well. And then the ninth thing that the society relied totally on Christ as head, no human governing po uh, power. So obviously this is kind of, this is his thinking. Uh, we, we're, we're not going to appeal to a body like the Presbytery. We're going to appeal to Christ as, uh, again, pointed out in the scripture. So nine points of the declaration. The address, uh, the 26,000 words, again, we don't have a lot of time and, and uh, so buy the book. Uh, but uh, here's the paragraph leading to the 13 um, uh, points or propositions of, uh, of the address. And, and again, this is addressed to the association. Here's what we're, here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. So he says, let none imagine that the subjoining propositions are all, are at all intended as an over, overture toward a new creed or a standard for the church or as in any wise design to be made a term of communion. Nothing can be further from our intention. So, in other words, he's trying to say, we're, we're not starting a new church. I mean, how do you say that <laughs> any more clearly? Uh, he says, they are merely designed for opening up the way that we may come fairly and firmly to the original ground upon clear and certain premises and take up things just as the apostles left them that thus disentangled from the accruing embarrassments of intervening ages. In other words, we've messed this up down through the centuries. We may stand with evidence upon the same ground on which the church, that's the church of the New Testament, stood at the beginning, having said so much to solicit attention and, and uh, prevent mistake, we submit as follows. And I'm just going to give you the first one. You can go back and read the, read the other, uh, other 12. Here's the first one. Proposition number one, that the church of Christ upon earth is essentially, intentionally, it's what we've, we're intending to do, constitutionally, in other words, from, from the basis of the scriptures and constitutionally one consisting of all those in every place. Reminds you of John 4, what Jesus said about uh, in every place. 
people drawing near to God. Uh, he says, in every place that profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him in all things according to the confession, no, to the scriptures, uh, according to the scriptures, and that manifest the same by their tempers and conduct, and of none else as none else can be truly and properly called Christians. Well, that's a mouthful, and I'm sure that would have taken 26,000 words to unfold. And so he does that uh, in the course of that discussion. It is a document well worth reading and, uh, and thinking about. But just in giving you what I've given you, I think you can pretty well see what his thinking is in the writing of it. It's a, it's a call to a group of people who are in a denomination. You gotta remember these people were in a, in a pretty much of a, a, a dark place as far as their knowledge and complete understanding about being the church of the New Testament. They knew about it, but the cry that he is making in this document is for us to go back to it and to be, to be that completely and totally and let that be the authority for all that we do. And so, that's what the address is all about. Now, I want to spend the remainder of our time thinking about kind of the background of Thomas and what led him up to being able to write such a document as this that he would, and later Alexander would say that he would devote him his life to, uh, or the concepts of, uh, that uh, would lead him to write this document. So let's, let's think about his background. Of course, he's, he's Irish. He's born in Northern Ireland, County Down, uh, Northern Ireland. You see the picture there of St. Patrick's Church of Ireland. Uh, I had the opportunity in 2012 to visit that place, that cemetery there. You know, I, I love cemeteries. And uh, in that cemetery, I found the grave of Ennis Campbell, who was the brother of Thomas Campbell. And so he's got relatives buried there. But that, uh, that big church on the hill overlooks this beautiful uh, little, uh, little town uh, of Newry, where he was born and where he grew up. Now, it's interesting, his father, Archibald, now he was, um, he was a Catholic initially, but he converted to the Church of England. But what he always said about that was, he says uh, that he served God according to act of parliament. And of course, if you know a little bit about your history, you know how that the Church of England kind of rebelled against the Catholic Church and they, under Henry VIII, and they established the church in, in, uh, in England. Didn't look a whole lot different. And certainly the authority of it was not much different. And I think a lot in this statement kind of explains the mindset of the church of that day. And that is that there was no separation between church and state. In other words, the state pretty much told the church what to do. Now that's, I think in our society today, we've gotten a little bit of you know, on the other end of that, where we, we don't want the church to have any kind of influence on society. Um, and, and you'll hear people talk about that, but that was never our founding father's intent to say that the church would never influence society or that, that it would influence government. Uh, but the initial idea was that when people came to America, they wanted the freedom to be able to explore through God's word, explore through their conscience and their mind as they, were, as they approached the word of God, the direction that they should go for themselves. They could not do that in Europe. And that's the kind of background that that uh, Thomas grows up in. So making that statement is, is powerful because it kind of tells us a whole lot about, uh, you know, I'm a Christian because the government says for me to be a Christian. That's essentially what he said. And so that's why he was a church of, uh, in the Church of England. Uh, Thomas uh, attended the University of Glasgow. Being from um, Ireland, he went over uh, to Glasgow, Scotland, attended the Presbyterian-based uh, college there. And so I think his dad initially really wanted him to be a, a preacher in the Church of England, uh, naturally. But of course, going to the University of Scotland at Glasgow, uh, that would have influenced him toward the the Church of Scotland. And uh, certainly that's what he 
uh, ultimately became a, a preacher in the Church of Scotland. That's what he's ordained to be. In 1787, he entered Whitburn uh, Seminary. Now, uh, this seminary is an Annie Berger Seceder Presbyterian Church School. And uh, I wanna, I, I'll explain that a little bit more, but uh, that explains a lot about what's going on in the church. The same year, he marries Jane Cornegal. Um, now, Jane has French Huguenot background uh, in her life, and, and, and they moved into Northern Ireland where she was born and, and was, was raised. But if you remember much about your church history, the Huguenots were... Uh, in the 16th century were basically uh, in France what the Puritans were in England. They were a group of people that rejected uh, the high church mentality and the organization. They'd read the Bible. They were essentially Calvinist in nature and uh, part of what ultimately was the the Protestant revolution. And so he marries a girl raised in a uh, a background where they question things that the high church does. And so here again, what's in the mind of Thomas as he's writing a document in 1809 goes all the way back to the woman he marries. And so uh, several connections there. Of course, his son Alexander, who's most known uh, in the restoration movement, is born in 1788. He's the first of, uh, of nine children. But I think we have to really back up even further. Uh, you look historically to the influence of the Reformation in, uh, in the British Isles. You have to see that kind of perspective. And what I'm going to share with you from this slide is, is essentially uh, what we would spend half a semester talking about in a church history class uh, that we would talk about the Scottish Reformation. But uh, people like John Wycliffe back in the 1300s, uh, he is, you know, he writes an English Bible. Uh, he stands against the church of, uh, of his day and encourages them to follow the Bible along. See, that's kind of what the reformers did. Uh, and so uh, undoubtedly that mindset by the time Thomas is born, it's just permeating all through the British Isles, actually all through Europe. Of course, John Knox, he rises against, in Scotland, rises against the Catholic stronghold there, Cardinal Beaton, and there are wars, and, and of course, Knox is a, he's a student of John Calvin, and, and so he starts the, the Church of Scotland that by its nature was rebellion against the Catholic, uh, the Catholic influence. However, it kind of turned into a little bit similar to their sister down the road or the brother maybe, uh, the Church of England because there was a lot of things that in all three churches that looked very much alike uh, in organization and, and things like that. It's not until people like John Glass who was a Presbyterian minister comes along and in the early 1700s uh, is as a Presbyterian minister, he is just filling his church full of people because most of his, and, and I didn't say this, if you're going to be a Presbyterian minister, you've got to promise part of your ordination. You've got to promise that you're going to be true to the Westminster Confession of Faith, that you're going to preach it, that you're going to promote it, and that's going to be your primary source of teaching the world. Well, that's not what John Glass did. Uh, John would preach the Bible, and people were coming in droves to hear him preach the Bible. And uh, he got in a lot of trouble for it, a lot of trials that he went through as, as a result of it. But in, seven, in the 1720s, now this is 40 years before uh, Thomas is born, over in northern uh, Scotland, just across the, across the, 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 wa the water, uh, he starts a society. Now you think about the word society. I don't know a whole lot of words that would describe uh, something that you're trying to tell people in the world, we're not a new church, what, what, but we're a group. What do we call ourselves? Well, if you look historically, uh, the Wesleys, when they started Methodism, it was a society. 
and, and they use those terms. So, you know, for Thomas to talk about the, the, uh, uh, the society uh, of the Washington, you know, uh, society, uh, he's not talking, again, they're trying to distance themselves from the idea of being uh, a new church on the block. So uh, 40 years ago, this is, this is going on in northern Scotland. But then you've got other people, and here we, we could spend a lot more time thinking about them. So um, Robert Haldane, the son-in-law of John Glass, um, uh, Robert Sandeman, rather, um, he... Um, there's a book in 1755 that hits the, you know, the, 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 the bookstore racks. It's written by John Harvey, and it's called Theron and Anaspasio. Essentially what it was is it was a book to nail down once again the tenets of Calvinism. And man, that thing went like wildfire all throughout the British Isles. They thought, man, this is the greatest thing. Uh, because by and large, Calvin had really, he was the rule of the day, the influence of the day. And so <laughs> Sandman reads uh, Theron and Espazio, and as he's reading through, he's going, that's not right. No, I, I, you can't find that in the Bible. You know, he's making doctrinal stands that can't be proved by the word of God. And so he says somebody's got to say something. And so Robert writes a book called Letters on Theron and Espazio two years later. He puts it out there, and I'm telling you that thing was like the on the uh, number one bestseller list. I mean, everybody, they were buying this thing up and uh, reading it, and it was changing the minds of Calvinist thinking that says, you know, God knows already who he's going to save. He's chosen you from birth if you are one of the, uh, the allotted ones, and uh, Jesus only died for you, and uh, he's going to save you, and if he wants to enter in your heart and, and, um, and lift you up and, and to give you some sort of experience, then he'll do that. Um, but uh, we're not going to be that way. And that, that was pretty much the way that the, the church of that day, the Presbyterian church of that day was. Uh, and, and you really see that case in point in the Haldanes. Now the Haldanes, they had a, a wonderful way about them. And, and it, it's amazing how you can have the theology of um, the theology right uh, or a theology that is contrary in thinking to the, the major mindset of the day, of Calvinism of the day. But if you don't have the money to be able to make it happen, He's, here, was, here were a couple of brothers, Robert and James, who were from Air 3 Castle in, in Stirling, Scotland. And I mean, they, you know, they, uh, I mean they, had, they were orphans when they were children, but their parents left them just, just so, so much wealth. And, and they bought into the idea that we could go back to the Bible. And in fact, they thought, you know, the best thing we can do for the people of Scotland is to introduce them to the Bible. Well, the problem was, is this church of Scotland was not trying to tell people about the Bible. They were kind of like the high church all through Europe. Uh, the Roman church that said, yeah, 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 let's just stay away from the Bible. And they taught their priests, don't teach the Bible. Don't put the Bible in the hands of the people. Well, the Haldanes got a hold of the Bible and they said, everybody needs to read this. And they had the money to make it happen. And so they thought one of the best ways to do that is to start schools. And so they had Saturday schools. People would come out of the coal mines. They were, they were ignorant. They had no education. Didn't know how to read and write. And so they just started starting these Saturday schools. They even took a Presbyterian minister by the name of, of Greville Ewing. Now, a lot of times we think about Greville Ewing and his connection to Alexander Campbell. But a long time before he meets Alexander Campbell, the young student, uh, boy, what a life and influence uh, for missionary work all through the British Isles uh, was Greville Ewing. So he, he deserves a lot of focus himself. So what the Haldanes do who have the money, they actually hire Greville Ewing. He'd been a Presbyterian minister. Uh, in fact, even uh, was so uh, convinced at one time, around, around 1800, was so convinced that we need to be more evangelistic with the word of God that he even edited a, a magazine 
that was devoted to evangelism. They even took evangelistic trips into Ireland, into northern Scotland, into the, into the British Isles, all, all, all these places. He'd go in the summers and he would devote himself to teaching people and he'd teach in barns and and uh, any place he could find where people would come in here and people just dro came in droves. So uh, he's, he's super intelligent. He's well learned in the scriptures. Even, even wrote, wrote a Greek grammar at one time. So we're not talking about any top water here. Uh, this guy is really, really smart. And so he's teaching in these schools that are paid for by the Haldanes. And uh, I mean, people are learning the Bible. And as they learn the Bible, their hearts are changed. And they're coming to realize that the high churches of their experience was so far away from God that something had to be, you know, that they had to stand up. And so you have people standing up for it. And Thomas is is growing up in this in this atmosphere now around 1800 of course the British Isles it, it, it's embroiled between the evangelicals and the and the state church and of course these men are, are part of that uh, but uh, uh, you know Thomas is is seeing that kind of thing uh, as he's learning and he's being educated I want to just spend just a couple of minutes telling you about the high church itself, uh, the, the Church of Scotland. It was a divided church. And so I'm going to kind of give you some scenarios here and maybe explain just briefly what, uh, what was going on in these churches. First of all, you have, you have different kind of branches. You have old lights and new lights. Uh, it was a controversy discerning the laws of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is their main body of doctrine in the Presbyterian Church, and that people should be amenable to new light from Scripture. So you had a whole group of people that thought, yeah, you know, hold on to the confession, but you need to focus on what the Scripture has to give you as well. Then you had seceders versus anti-seceders. You have seceders, they could pick their own minister. If you were, if you were a seceder Presbyterian, uh, you were able to pick your own minister as a congregation. But then you had the anti-seceders <laughs> that uh, allowed the high church, the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh, they, they would choose who your preacher is going to be. And then you had the burger versus any burger. In 1747, the Presbyterians separated over the burger control. A burger was like a mayor of the city. He, he, essentially, he was like sheriff of the town. He ran everything. And if you remember separation of church and state, church and state like we were talking about before, a burger, pretty well, just told the church what they should do or what they shouldn't do. So if you were burger, you were for that kind of approach to religion. If you were anti-burger, then you were against that uh, uh, approach of religion. And so you got all these divisions. Now, very quickly, so what you could have is you could have a seceder burger Presbyterian church. You could have a seceder anti burger Presbyterian church. You could have an anti seceder burger Presbyterian church. You could have an anti seceder, anti seceder, anti burger Presbyterian church. And you could have an old light, new light church. Then that kind of add that to the mix. And you can just see what kind of division is going on in the state church. Uh, it, was, it was, to say the least, a divided church. So, in. From 1798 to 1807, Thomas moves his family to the small village of Rich Hill. It's in Northern Ireland. It's not too far from his home, just north, about 30 miles from Belfast. And uh, had an opportunity to visit this building in 2012. And uh, if you see the kind of the Norman Tower in the front, that was actually only added in the 1970s uh, there. But here's, here's, here's the significance of the church. It's an old light church. So basically, it holds sternly to the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's an Annie Burger church. And it uh, doesn't want uh, to have any kind of enlightenment beyond the, beyond the scriptures. Can you see how Thomas might have had some problems with that? 
uh, against the, to the total control of the burger or the mayor of the town being over the church and telling the church what it could do. And of course they were sec seceder in that they had seceded from the idea of having the high church pick their minister. And so this <laughs> kind of explains. But again, you're liable to have all these others in the same town. Um, so all these kinds of divisions. I'll just say quickly, uh, again, that tower was, was added. And if you see there on the front, you see it's the Thomas Campbell Tower. That was basically a par paid for by the Disciples of Christ in America. Uh, in fact, I think I have, yeah, I have some pictures from in inside the, the building there. Uh, and but you know you've got a couple hundred year old church building that they added this tower to and it says there right inside the door erected to the glory of God in the memory of Thomas Campbell second minister of this church co-founder with his son and others of the disciples of Christ in America this tower largely the gift of American friends we dedicated 30 December 1973 there's a window there it's got Alexander name, uh, Campbell's name in it as that's the church that he grew up in it's so it's, it's well worth seeing. I could spend a lot of time telling you about it. Uh, they lived in town. They lived on the city square. And I put these two pictures in here to kind of give you the, the setting. Uh, it's called Rich Hill for a reason. It's a hill. It's a, and at the top of the hill, there is a manor. And there's a picture at the bottom there of Rich Hill Manor or the castle. Uh, the lord of the castle is the Richardson family. So Thomas and Jane live directly across the street. Really, you, you have the, house, the manor, you have the city square across from the manor, and across from the square is the home of Thomas and Jane Campbell. And so they're teaching their children there, but they also start an academy and, and other children are, are brought in. Um, and, uh, but then in 1803, while he's there preaching, uh, the Puritan religion that was also established in town, they start bringing these evangelicals from the uh, anywhere and everywhere. So people like Roland Hill and Alexander Carson and John Walker and James Alexander Haldane, they come through and preach. Uh, Thomas meets all these guys and gets to know them, and he, he's hearing them their message of evangelistic Christianity. He even joins a missionary group called the Evangelical Society. So in 1807, um, of course, around this time, Alexander uh, becomes a personal tutor to Lord uh, Richardson's children uh, across the street. And so he's a young man who's just really coming into his own, smart, smart young man. Uh, but then... In the winter of 1806-1807, Alexander, or, or Thomas rather, really has a tough winter. Uh, he has dyspepsia, which is basically a bad case of uh, acid reflux. Uh, and um, he is, um, he, he's weak all the time, um, maybe even anemic. Um, he goes to his doctors and he said, I don't think you, I don't think you can last another uh, Irish winter. And so he says, you need to get out here. You need to go, maybe go to the Americas where you can have a chance to live a long life. And so they make a huge sacrifice as a family. He, he gets him aboard a vessel and um, he, uh, he leaves in April of 1807 and makes his way to America. Well, he's... He, he gets here, and, and the way he's going to take care of himself is he's going to be a Presbyterian minister. And so he comes here, and he uh, uh, connects himself with the Presbytery that is in place there in the western part of, of Pennsylvania. And, uh, and so he, he uh, becomes ordained by the Chartier's Presbytery, committed to the Westminster Confession of Faith and, and, and he begins the process of conducting business as usual, right? However, you've got to remember the kind of influence of his background. Now, I, we could spend a little time thinking about this, but just to say the least, if you look historically to the denominations that were in Europe and planted themselves in America, what happened was a lot of those denominations uh, pretty much came to America and there was a mindset to really set in firm format the way of 
the ancient thinking. And so the Presbyterians who were in, in, in America were thinking firmly, we've got to be just like the Westminster Confession of Faith says for us to be. So they were strict Calvinists. However, the fact that evangel evangelism had entered into the fray of Thomas's life, giving people the idea that uh, maybe they had an opportunity uh, to, as an adult, make a choice for God, uh, it just really changed the mix of things for him. And so he comes in a new place. His old background, his old influence is, you know, we got to preach the confession, but the Bible's important too. And so there becomes a problem. He gets assigned to going up the Allegheny River and preaching to, uh, to groups of people who were of his division of Presbyterianism. He gets up there and he notices that there are some other Presbyterians that aren't a part of their group. Uh, and he's offering the Lord's Supper. And uh, the people... Uh, you know, they have to wait for their version of, of pastor to come along so that they can take the Lord's Supper. He said, well, that's nonsense. They're Presbyterian. Let's, let's let them take the Lord's Supper. Well, when they did that, or when he did that, he got in trouble. And so you can look at, um, now, William Hanna. There, there's two biographies on Thomas Campbell. One written, written by Alexander. The other one was written by William Hanna. What Hanna does is he takes what Alexander says, but he also finds some, some of the early documents, like the, uh, the entries of the Chartier's Pres uh, Chartier Presbyterian. And actually, Alexander, uh, just to make it simple, Alexander stayed in trouble the whole time he... <laughs> Until the time his son came in the fall of 1809, he stayed in trouble. Uh, it was just, if it was one thing, it was another. But mainly, it centered around the Bible and the use of it and the authority of it. And uh, he was not as true to the, pres uh, to the confession as they, they wanted him to be. And so finally, in May of 1809... He, uh, he decides, I, I can't do this. So he, I, I can't stay true to the Presbyterian way of thinking, not here. They're just so trying to do it exactly the way they think it needs to be done. I need to have the freedom to go to the Bible and the Bible alone. And so he decides that he is going to, um, he's going to write a document and he's going to call it the Declaration and Address. And in May of 1809, he sends an, a declaration and address to the Chartier's Presbytery. It's an open letter to the Presbyterians suggesting what, suggesting what the Christian Association of Washington was trying to accomplish. This society of group, won a new church. It's basically all the things that you read about in the declaration and address. Well, it was strongly rejected by the presbytery. You see what he was doing there is he was trying to see if he could maybe through the influence of God's word, not just uh, help the people of the association, but to help the whole presbytery into a direction that was more in thinking and in keeping with the word of God. Folks, that's what the reformers of yesteryear were all about. Uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages. That's what they were trying to do, trying to get people to go back to the Word of God. Um, it failed. And so during the summer of 1809, he is uh, living uh, in the house of Mr. Welch. He does live too far from the association. Uh, and um, he allows him to stay in an upper room there and he rewrites the declaration and address that he had written to the to the uh, Chartier Presbytery and uh, he really focuses on okay here's what we're going to do as a group we're going to go back to the Bible and we're going to do Bible things in Bible ways and where the Bible speaks we're going to speak and where the Bible is silent we're going to be silent we're going to use Bible names to do Bible things and some of those words that you hear um, or you're hearing me say are things that he was preaching all through the summer but finally to come out and say that uh, in that, on that occasion in, um, in uh, September of 1809 was a bold stand 
for a group of people who are just trying to find God and follow God to the best of their ability. And so if you ever have a chance to go to Washington, PA, uh, you know, downtown there is a, there's a historical marker that, uh, that tells you about here's the place the declaration and address was, was printed. Um, you can find the house. In fact, if you go to the, therestorationmovement.com, and I'm not just trying to promote it, but it's just got so much of this information. In fact, if you want this PowerPoint, you can, uh, you can go there and download it and, and use it yourself. But you're welcome to any of the information that's there. Thank you so much. You've listened so well and kindly this morning. Wish you all the best. And y'all do come and, and hear my brother David tomorrow. God bless.